Hello, I'm Bill McGee. And I'm Joanna Tiagarajan. We are your co-chairs for this evening's online gala and auction. The Art of Nature. Thank you so much for joining us. And for supporting the Washington Park Arboretum. Enjoy the Art of Nature. Good evening. I'm Jenny Wyatt, President of the Arboretum Foundation Board. Welcome to our celebration of the Art of Nature. We acknowledge that the City of Seattle and its green spaces are on traditional lands of the Coast Salish people. We recognize their stewardship of this land since time immemorial and take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers, past and present, of this land. This acknowledgement is a small act in the ongoing work of the Arboretum Foundation to be in good relationship with the land and the people of the land. Well, good evening and welcome to the Arboretum Foundation's 2022 Gala and Auction, The Art of Nature. I am Angela Poe Russell from King 5 Evening and a proud member of the Washington Park Arboretum Fan Club. And I'm Jane Stonecipher, Executive Director of the Arboretum Foundation. We're so happy to have all of you here with us tonight as we come together to support the Arboretum and the Seattle Japanese Garden. All right, so how about those berets that Joanna and Bill were wearing? They're very artsy, yeah? It looks like we're in for a fun evening. You know, I've heard a rumor that we'll be having some special guests. Absolutely, and uh, some of our homegrown Arboretum celebrities, too. Okay, well, before we jump into things, this is a good time to just take care of some housekeeping. First, we want to assure you that all COVID precautions were taken in the creation of tonight's program. Next, let's make sure everyone has the link to the auction page. It's afgala22.ggo.bid. That's afgala.22.ggo.bid. Now, this page will be your center for all things auction this evening and also where you'll go to donate to the Arboretum. So many people are getting started with that already. Now, if you haven't registered yet, you still have time. Click the Get Started button on that page. If you've already signed up, just log in or click your personalized link in the latest text or email. Now, some of you may be wondering how to watch the program and bid at the same time. So I have a couple of insider tips. Insider tip number one, ask a teenager. Insider <laughs> tip number two, um, you might want to watch the live stream on a larger screen like a laptop or smart TV and then grab a second screen like a phone or a tablet to bid and donate. As most of you know, it takes a lot of financial support from the community to bring our city, uh, the horticulture, education, and cultural programming at the Arboretum and the Japanese Garden. Tonight, we're asking you to dig deep and support this amazing place for everyone who visits. Yes, and there's even a magic thermometer to watch as donations increase throughout the evening. So please donate whenever you're ready. We'd also love to hear from you this evening. You can make comments using the chat feature in YouTube. Use the chat to ask questions. Let us know where you're viewing from and what you love about the Arboretum. Well, I, I can see already that we have viewers from Seattle, from Port Townsend, wow, from Minnesota. I love that. Well, keep those comments coming. Let us know where you're watching from and just what you love about the Arboretum. We'll check in on that in just a few minutes. Now, Jane, I was flipping through the auction catalog. I I'm really was really trying there. I love some of, the, you have some amazing items. In addition to the art, you've got the dinner cruise, some really cool stuff, Raptor watching. Yeah, I love it. And I love that you have landscape consults, spring planters, a tour of the spheres, just mm -hmm. some really unique items. Well, and speaking of unique items, um, our John Grotti experience is one of the most unique things that I've ever seen in an auction, and I've been to a lot of auctions. <laughs> I bet you have. <laughs> <laughs> um, so John is doing large-scale commissions all over the world, and this is a chance to be behind the scenes with him and impress your friends. Yeah, so, you know, we talked about art and nature, so how do they go together for this year's theme? Well, it's interesting when you think about it. So many of the world's great artists have been inspired by nature and sometimes right here in the Arboretum. And it's not just beauty they create, but a shared sense of community. Yeah, and I'm sure some of tonight's guests will be able to talk about that, right? For sure, for sure. And that's, uh, first let's hear from Jennifer Ott, everybody's favorite environmental historian and author of the book, Olmsted in Seattle. She's gonna tell us how one of the greatest artistic masters masterpieces of all, the Arboretum itself, was created. It's a pretty inspiring story. 
let's get started. The art of nature begins with nature itself. The moss, trees, and rocks found in the landscapes of our wild places have long inspired people to create. However, in cities, much of that wildness gets swept away in the early throes of development. Today, when we look at the wonderful landscape of the Washington Park Arboretum, it's easy to assume that someone just came in and carefully added pathways through a lush forested landscape that always existed, while well, nothing could be further from the truth. What the landscape looked like in Seattle right after the logging occurred, and it was happening all across the city. And so we have some photographs and we can get a sense from some notes that the Olmsted brothers made while they were here in Seattle, that there were some random trees standing, trees that were not useful for lumbering, there was lots of underbrush. You know, there was the slash and burn, the stuff that had been left behind. So it would have been quite messy when they came along. How was this degraded landscape transformed into the beautiful place we know today? The answer starts with a master plan prepared by the most highly respected landscape architecture firm in the world. So Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. was all sorts of things. He had quite a varied career, but the thing that we know him most for is that he essentially founded the discipline of landscape architecture in the United States. And um, he's most famous for, uh, with his partner, Calvert Vox, designing Central Park and then Prospect Park. And, um, but he did an amazing amount of writing and speaking where he really developed Americans' ideas of why do we need public space and why is it important? Around the turn of the 20th century, the Olmsted firm, now run by the next generation, was hired by Seattle's Board of Park Commissioners to design a system of boulevards and parks for the growing city. The route for Lake Washington Boulevard was laid out in 1904, but the surrounding parkland would remain undeveloped for almost three more decades. Fast forward to the 1930s, Seattle and the nation are in the grips of the Great Depression. When the depression started, the um, governor at the time was looking for places that they could put this money from the State Emergency Relief Administration. And they were looking for shovel-ready projects, uh, projects where people could be put to work immediately to relieve the unemployment situation. And so he asked his advisor, Lauren Grinstead, for ideas. And Lauren's wife, Edna, who happened to be a member of the Seattle Garden Club, um, jumped at the opportunity because she knew how much the University of Washington wanted to develop an arboretum in Washington Park. And uh, Grinstead and the governor took it. They were then faced with the difficulty of, since they could only pay for labor, how were they gonna get a design that would direct that labor because they didn't wanna just set loose a bunch of people, clear an underbrush and not have a plan. And so uh, the Seattle Garden Club actually paid for the fee for the design, and which made it possible. There was no other money in the budget that would have made that possible. And so uh, they were able to get an Olmsted design for the whole park, finally. In keeping with other arboretums of the time, the plan completed in 1936 organized the plant collections according to plant type. The park's popular speedway for horse racing, originally the skid road used to log the property, became its defining ornamental feature, Azalea Way, a three-quarter mile grassy promenade flanked by azaleas, dogwoods, and flowering cherries. The Arboretum that we visit today still has some pretty significant uh, pieces that are Olmstedian, that they date back to those original plans. Um, but you still see in Azalea Way, you see the interior view that is an amazing Olmsted design element. Is it takes advantage of that axis that was created by the racetrack. And instead of obliterating it and trying to reshape it, they took advantage of it. And you have this wonderful um, walk through the core of the Arboretum that is flanked by a multi-story canopy. Another interior view that I love, and it's actually my favorite one in the Arboretum, is from the um, outlook that's up near the New Zealand Garden today and it looks across the valley. If you didn't have that outlook, it would be hard to really understand the topography of Washington Park. And it also gives you that sense of um, looking inward into the park and really feeling lost in the trees. Once the initial construction work was complete, detailed designs of the remaining spaces in the Arboretum were developed over many decades, artfully shaping the landscapes we enjoy today. 
A good example is Rhododendron Glen, which was originally designed in-house just after the completion of the Olmsted plan. New visioning and design work continues to this day as part of the current Rhododendron Glen restoration project. The planting process in the Upper Glen um, is interesting because first I paid a lot of attention to gardens that I've seen that have this kind of uh, woodland character heavily featured with rhododendrons such as the Rhododendron Species Foundation, Heronswood Garden, and the Elizabeth Miller Garden. I talked to members of each of those gardens just to figure out the conditions in which rhododendrons and companion plants might do best within this arboretum setting. And then I've also really paid a lot of attention over the years to combining textures, uh, colors, shapes, because with rhododendrons, superficially, they can look somewhat similar. And so, and they're not in bloom for very long individually. So it's really important to have that combination of layers, textures, leaf shapes, and different seasons of interest. I think as rhododendron glen develops, you know, in five to 10 years, you're gonna see a much more layered planting. You're gonna see a lot of uh, really exciting plants, bold foliage, uh, interesting textures bark colors, something that really catches the eye and merits repeat viewing throughout the year. The Washington Park Arboretum is much more than a city park. It is also a world-class botanic garden and outdoor classroom and the official state arboretum of Washington. It's a 230-acre living museum. No, not that kind of a museum a living museum of plants and trees. We have more than 40,000 different plants from 98 countries around the world here. That's plants from six out of the seven continents except Antarctica, because well, <laughs> only penguins grow there. Who cares for all those plants you ask? Well, we have a small but mighty team working out on the grounds to keep the landscapes and collections strong and vibrant. Two of that team are the arborists and like the Lorax, <clears throat> they speak for the trees. These folks monitor and care for our trees to keep the collection healthy, beautiful, and safe for visitors from all around the world to enjoy. Your donations make it possible for us to maintain the collection and support our local Loraxes, the arborists, in their important work. So donate now, click the donate button on your device to support the Arboretum. Thank you. Uh, so well said, and I love the appearance by the Lorax. Nice touch. Such a great story about the Arboretum's origin as well. And I understand that Julie Spidell, one of the premier artists in tonight's auction, has a connection to the story. Yes, so Julie's grandparents helped advocate for the original WPA funding back in the 1930s that allowed the construction to begin and she created a beautiful painting for tonight's event in their honor. Yeah, I've seen Julie's work and I love this piece. It is called Delvin, named for the 15th century Irish castle that inspired it. Take a look at that. And she's not the only artist with a link to the Arboretum. Barbara Earl Thomas has also shared a piece called Man Cleaning His Fish. Barbara's father worked for the Parks Department and spent part of his career at the Japanese Garden. Uh, we have some other wonderful art in the auction as well. Uh, we appreciate all the artists who are supporting us this evening and hope you'll check out their work. Okay, speaking of the auction, I spy a special guest who might have some insider tips for us. So let's welcome gardening guru and TV personality, Cisco Morris. Hi there, Cisco. Hey, hi you two. It's so great to be here. It's just more fun than I can describe. But there are a lot of things left to bid on. And I just heard that there's one spot left on my Kathy Freeze tour. So I want that thing filled up within the next 12 seconds, okay? <laughs> hey, so what are some of the really fun ones that are out there? How about the New York experience? So have you been to the Big Apple? Is there anywhere more fun? You get your airfare, you stay in a really fancy hotel, you get free passes to the Brooklyn Botanical Garden, and then while you're there, you go to Times Square, see yourself on that gigantic screen out there. You go to Little Italy and have the best dinner you've ever had in your whole <laughs> life. It is just the most fun. You better go to a play while you're there too. And then, how about this one? The uh, botanical and gastronomical uh, superior <laughs> of Bainbridge Island. So you get to 
go to Bloedel Reserve and get a private tour by my buddy and the head honcho, Ed, uh, uh, well, Ed, anyway. <laughs> Sorry, Ed. Ed, uh, Ed Mo Moyel. And also you get a really great dinner from Heyday Farm to Table, which is, I've had friends say, it's the best dinner you'll ever have. I'm sure there'll be a lot of Brussels sprouts on that one. <laughs> Oh, I love Cisco. <laughs> Thank you so much, Cisco. I, I tell you, a tremendous job. You get that tremendous? I love, <laughs> that was bad, I'm trying. Um, you know, I'm already seeing, so one spot left on the tour that Cisco talked about, and I understand there's a bidding war on the Julie Spidel piece. So we got a lot of action happening in the auction, and we hope that you will jump in and just be part of it. That, that's right. Um, there's also an amazing dinner cruise on Lake Washington, a Mariner Suite for 20, and uh, the John Grotti experience. Yes. Uh, we would also like to do a few thank yous already. Uh, thank you, Spafford Robbins. Thank you, Sylvia Wolf, Mimi Richards, Lisa Youngblood Hall. Yes, and I also see Heather. Um, thank you for your donation. Martha Draves, thank you. I see Carl Baker, and I see no one coming in now from Dr. Joseph Berkson. I know I can't get to everyone, but we just want you to know we see your contributions and we really appreciate them. And I see that a number of volunteers are with us tonight. You know, while we're still navigating around the pandemic, it's been really wonderful to welcome volunteers back to so many programs. Yeah, you have a whole village of volunteers. I remember learning about that last year, people who support the Arboretum in all kinds of ways. You've got people who volunteer in the gift shop. You've got docents at the Japanese garden, and that's just me. We, we have volunteers everywhere. <laughs> We have garden stewards who help keep the grounds looking spiffy. And I'd like to give a shout out to our longtime volunteers at the Pat Calvert Greenhouse, who are our plant propagation experts, and the Plant Donations Nursery, where you can upcycle your gently used plants. Yeah, and you do group projects as well, right? Yes, indeed. Uh, we love hosting corporate groups. And you know, with so many employees working from home right now, an afternoon outside in the Arboretum together with your team is really a great way to connect. In fact, one of tonight's sponsors, Brighton Jones, brought groups four different times in 2021. Wow. And Alyssa Henry, who's the friend of the Lorax that you just saw, well, she can help you organize an outing. And she's so much fun. So I think that sounds like a plan. Alyssa, we'll be talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> we also appreciate our volunteer units who act as Arboretum advocates throughout the Puget Sound region. And a special thank you to Unit 38 tonight, not only for your financial support, but for your many years of involvement. As we think of volunteers, uh, we lost a special one, Skip Vonks, the day after Christmas. Skip was a multi-term board member, a garden steward, and active with the Japanese garden. We've already received donations tonight in Skip's honor, as well as in memory of two other Arboretum giants, John Watt and Ian Robertson. And we just wanna say a thank you to everyone who has made a gift already tonight. And speaking of saying thank you, we wanna thank our generous sponsors who helped underwrite this evening's event. First, our silver level sponsor, Freestone Capital. And a big thank you to Noriko and Doug Palmer and to some wonderful returning sponsors, Marshall and Sullivan, Park Shore, NBBJ, Safeco, and WSECU. Yes, and we're delighted to welcome Bellevue Children's Academy. You mentioned Brighton Jones and Carr Tuttle as sponsors this year. The foundation is also grateful for in-kind support from our studio partner, Seattle Lives. They're making all of this happen. The Northwest Flower and Garden Festival, Alaska Airlines, and Gobo Enterprises. Uh, we have more thanking to do, but I think that more of our special guests are ready to make their virtual debut. We heard a few minutes ago how the Arboretum is a work of art itself. Well, let's flip that and hear how the Arboretum inspires artists to create and help us see the world differently. Themes of nature are integral to the work of many Seattle artists. One such example is John Grotti, one of the most exciting artists currently working with natural themes and materials in the world. With large scale installations at the Seattle Art Museum and SeaTac Airport, John imbues his work with a sense of kinetics, impermanence, and chance. 
I'm really interested in trees with my work. And when I trace back where that came from, it's kind of funny because it came from using wood as a material and then realizing I needed to be in, in better touch with where this wood is coming from and its story. And the, the path that led me there was really about how wood decays. So I got into various wood eating insects and they became collaborators and helping me form the different types of things I was making. And now I'm, I'm very much interested in where wood comes from. So I don't tend to make a sculpture with wood that you would buy at a, at a hardwood store. There's usually a, a story behind the wood. It's been salvaged from somewhere or comes from a specific tree. Gerard Sudakawa is an accomplished Northwest sculptor whose designs reflect the cultures and traditions of the Pacific Rim. In his early years, he was an apprentice for his father, George, and worked on the fabrication of the original memorial gates in the Arboretum. In, in my own personal sculptures, um, I've always taken themes from nature, and a lot of them were, would be abstractions from swirls or spirals or arches or um, uh, waves and um, motion and things like that. Or I've been really into the ocean and waves series lately and um, had a chance to do several small ones. And then I just completed the uh, sea wave piece for the Climate Pledge Arena, which is a pretty good sized bronze. But artists in the Arboretum come in all shapes and sizes. The Fiddleheads Outdoor Preschool students are among the most exuberant. One can only imagine how these early experiences will shape the joy and wonder of later life. One of my early memories, um, and this relates to the Arboretum, was being in a canoe um, with my family and um, on the South Shore um, and, and looking at the, the Arboretum landscape in that, that area and just being um, really taken with the idea that I could, I could sort of be at this low level, this, this sort of perspective on the landscape of the water. My father in particular really enjoyed the mountains, you know, painting, sumi painting and camping. And we'd be driving through the mountains and, and he'd tell my mother to pull over because he was looking at the mountains and she was driving and uh, he'd pull out his painting, painting gear and just start sketching away and painting. And he was very fast, so you know, he could do a, you know, a nice painting in, in, in maybe 10, 15 minutes. And then uh, at the ocean, it was the same thing, or at the beach at Hood Canal, you know, we have so many uh, paintings of the trees and the mountains. Both of these artists will be working on major installations for the Arboretum in the coming months. Later this evening, you'll hear more about the replacement of the beloved Sudakawa Gates. Meanwhile, we have begun to discuss an exciting project with John Grady, right here in the Arboretum. So I'm hoping to make a piece for the Arboretum in Seattle. And it, for me, it's a really compelling idea because it's home ground. It's, it's a kind of a baseline for me. I, over the past uh, couple of years, I've been starting to work on projects um, in other sculpture parks or gardens or Arboretum. So most recently for Kew Gardens, that's one we're, we're doing this, this summer. And it's, it's interesting when I go to a place like Kew Gardens and I look at certain things that are going on there, my baseline is coming back to the Arboretum in Seattle. So when I see a Chilean forest in the UK, I think, oh yeah, I can do that in Seattle as well. And then how can I kind of look at some of that, project my own history of growing up in that environment intermittently, and it just seems like potential for a really rich project. I'm drawn to a number of different specific groves in the, in the Arboretum, and I, I sort of what I like about the idea of engaging just a specific number of, a smaller number of trees is that it helps me define a sense of scale. I mean, it's a very large place, the Arboretum. So it'll be interesting to, to sort of move through the grounds. One of the things that we're doing in exploring this is my whole team and I are gonna come and tour the gardens with a bunch of the team from the gardens and talk about what's happening there, what's the history. And for me, when I get a lot of different people and, and their input, it's gonna be potentially much more interesting a project. The Arboretum Foundation provides important funding for the University of Washington Botanic Gardens education programs at the Arboretum. The program connects children and adults to nature and teaches them about the vital role that plants, forests, and wetlands play in our environment. One of the ways we teach kids about nature is through art. 
At the Fiddleheads Forest School Summer Session, art materials are left available for the students all day for free art exploration. They are encouraged to practice their letters while creating scenes from the nature they see around them. Your support helps us provide equitable access to unique experiential nature education. From the Fiddleheads Forest preschoolers who build their confidence and resilience in a magical setting among the trees, to our high school internship students who use the Arboretum's 230 acres as an ever-changing outdoor classroom to learn about environmental careers. So please donate now, just a click on the donate button on your device and you're all set. I uh, love seeing the Fiddleheads kids. You know, it makes you wonder how those moments in nature today might inspire the next great artist tomorrow. And wow, the John Grotti, I have seen his giant sculpture above the escalator at SeaTac, and he's gonna be doing an installation at the Arboretum, which is so cool. So here to tell us more about those plans is the new director of the University of Washington Botanic Gardens, Christina Owen, welcome. Thank you. Hi everyone, and thanks to you, Jane, and the Arboretum Foundation for inviting me to join you tonight. So we are so excited to work with the foundation to bring John Grotti's work to the Arboretum. He plans to begin that work on his piece this summer with installation planned for 2023. Not far from now, yeah. And we appreciate the support of the Aldera Foundation to help make this possible. If you'd like to get in on the action, I encourage you to check out the John Grotti Experience Package in the auction. Christina and I had a chance to visit John's studio and frankly, uh, we were both blown away, uh, both by John himself, um, as well as all the different projects he was working on in his giant studio in South Seattle. Yeah, it was absolutely incredible. Our team did do walk, did do was able to walk the grounds with John and he has already identified a few choice locations for his new piece. So stay tuned for more updates as the project unfolds later this year. Or you can bid on the tour with me and I can show you myself. Wow, and you know we have the um, John Grotti experience that's up for bid. So before we move on to our next topic, any one thing that just blew you away that in the, during that tour that you're like, you need to see this? Oh man. Um, so he was working on one project for Microsoft where he had taken uh, trees and had done very thin planes of the trees to reassemble them as sculptures that will go back on the campus. I mean, just so creative, um, unlike anything we've seen before. Yeah. What there, about was, for you? there was another one where that was going into uh, a, an embassy for the, for the United States, a U.S. embassy in South America, and he had planed this, these trees, so he had two big tree sculptures with about a three-foot gap, and they actually designed the building to mirror that gap all the way down the building. Yeah, that does sound just incredible. So definitely bid on that if you have not. Meanwhile, can you share a little bit about what's going on with the education programs? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So we added a third classroom to the Fiddleheads Forest Preschool in the fall to better support those families that really needed that full all-day day daycare. And then this summer, we'll continue with our summer camps, which as a pandemic parent of two, I fully appreciate those yes. high quality outdoor experiences with kids. And I know right now is summer camp time. We're all signing up. Oh yeah, connecting with nature too. You're away from the screen. Uh, you just can't beat it. Right. Absolutely. So those actually, the signups for those I think is the 15th. So watch for those. Okay. And then for teens, we offer two opportunities. So internships, working with the education programs, and then on the ground work crews with the Student Conservation Association. There's a lot going on. Well, yeah. thank Thank you so much, Christina. Um, you know, I see Cisco waving us down. Cisco, the last time we talked to you, you know, that thermometer was a bit lower. So I think you're having an impact. Oh, I think so. And whoa. And so, <laughs> Alyssa. Oh, la la. I am honored beyond <laughs> Tweedle to hear that. That must be what pushed the thermometer over the 100,000 mark. Oh, la la. But there's still some really great things left, and we got to fill that thermometer up. Okay, so have you seen the treehouse adventure? So, this is the ultimate romantic uh, thing. <laughs> if you're 93 or 22, buy this one, take your sweetheart for two nights up there in the treehouse. I guarantee if you're not married, you will be within two days after it's over. Oh, la, 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 la. <laughs> hey, and uh, how about the raptor tour? 
Have you seen that one? I hope you're bidding on that. I used to work on the North Cascade Highway. I worked in the town of New Halem as a gardener, and I hiked all the time up on the Skagit River, and that is the area that many people believe is why the eagles recovered so well in this country. You are gonna see so many eagles, see so many hawks, you might see owls, you might see coyotes, you might see a bear too, oh la la. <laughs> but I, it, I guarantee you're gonna love that one. And finally, what about that Julie Spidell painting, Delvin? So, this was inspired from her uh, Irish background. I think it is one of the most beautiful works of art I've ever seen. Can you imagine having that in your living room? Oh, la, la. Oh, so come on, get out there and bid. We want to hit the $200,000 mark. And now that you can't bid on my tour, it's going to be a little harder to do, but you could do it. Well, I think, Cisco, you sold people on the treehouse experience for sure, because I, I could see the owners just saying, you know, if you're not married, you will be. Come visit us, right? <laughs> So yes, lots of bidding going on. Nice to know we have Cisco there at the thermometer. Very encouraged by the direction in which we're moving. Visit the donate page now. Even if you've been there once, go there again or just take another swing at bidding on something. Go to Greater Giving to make your gift. Who might consider a gift of $10,000 or above? We're gonna start uh, at that level. Thank you, Larry Hovell and Shelly Butler for starting us off at $10,000. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Getting Cisco riled up, I love it. <laughs> so are you wondering how your gifts tonight will be used? So remember that our Arboretum is one of the few in the country with no fence and no admission charge. Uh, I love what our friend Swill Canem said last year, that we are keeping the spirit of the trees alive in our lives. So your gifts support our arborists who monitor and care for the sequoias, the maples, and my favorite, the magnolias. <laughs> and of course, the education programs that Christina told us about. Yes, you know, as you make your gifts this evening, please consider a donation of $5,000. And we already have some people who have jumped in at that level. Uh, John and Carol Herster, thank you so much for your $6,000 gift. Mike Riley and Robin Shapiro gave a gift of $5,000, thank you. And from Steve Alley and Amy Scott, thank you for your $7,500 contribution. A lot going on. Wow, and we have so many um, that have just come in here in the last few minutes. So uh, Kent and Sandy Carlson, Sean Corey, Elaine Springer, Sharon Nelson, Martha Draves, Adam Weintraub. Yes, I see Barbara Larson, uh, Carl Baker, Ray Larson, Ashley Clark, Carolyn Cachell, Nanette Richards. Thank you so much. Um, and I'd also like to thank Yuka Shimizu for her generous support. Yuka underwrote the Paul Chahara world premiere at last summer's garden party and has stepped up once again this evening. Thank you, Yuka. You know, there's so many different ways that the community steps up to support the Arboretum. You can just get in on so many different levels. And those Sudakawa gates, I mean, something happened there, right? It's quite a story. Yeah, um, so it was just as we were trying to adjust to the very first stage of the COVID crisis right. in March of 2020, and we got another shot that morning. So let's hear more about that now. Yeah, I do remember building those gates. Um, it was an interesting construction project. My father had done a few gates, but um, this one was particularly interesting because of its relationship to nature and kind of that floral theme. Well, I got to work that day and my coworker came out uh, and told me that the Sudakawa gates had been stolen. And I just, I couldn't believe it. And so I ran over and I looked at them and I just burst into tears. It was just so heart-wrenching. Uh, Amanda from the city uh, parks crew was first on site and uh, sent us all a message pretty early what, that they were gone. It was right at the beginning of COVID, which was, um, you know, kind of, a, bad news time and that kind of capped it off and I was completely shocked that somebody would actually have the audacity to come in there at night and cut the gates up. It had already been a tough week filled with the uncertainties of the early days of the pandemic. 
Just a few days earlier, we closed the visitor center and the Japanese garden and were navigating how to best serve the community while keeping staff safe. So it was an especially hard time to hear the news about the stolen gates. But in the rear view, it's also been a story of resilience, of a family legacy and of community. Later that day, you know, we talked to people in the community, we let people know what was going on, and we started to get all this support for replacing the gates. Uh, my father had a strong affinity for the Arboretum, the University of Washington, and nature. And I'm sure that he was very, would have been very upset to see the gates destroyed. And I'm extremely happy to see that uh, that connection is being rebuilt again. That's what I appreciate so much about our volunteers, our advocates, our supporters, is the willingness to see and address needs that benefit the community at large. I think the most important reason to support the Arboretum is that we've already invested in it as a community. There have been um, people hours and financial inputs and um, the care that goes toward the collections. And it's, it's just imperative that we do our part to carry that forward to the future. It's important to support the Arboretum for a variety of reasons. Um, unlike uh, a typical park, it's much more intentional or managed in terms of a plant collection. So we're really highlighting things that aren't just beautiful, but have some value for educational purposes, conservation purposes, but also just anytime you have a large scale garden that's for enjoyment and appreciation of nature, it, it really requires a lot of extra effort to keep it going. The Washington Park Arboretum is, I think, important to me because it allows us to have a, a way of engaging the landscape with a kind of repeated return. So instead of having to go out to a specific destination, we can integrate it into our week, into our month, and return and return, and have a sense of how things grow and evolve in a much more intimate way. Being at you know quiet contemplation, just relaxing, uh, you know, getting some exercise in, learning about something, all those things are possible in the Arboretum and um, really relies on a lot of support. And I think that's something that when people understand how much it requires to keep it looking the way it is or improving it, um, it's really important to remember that this doesn't happen by accident. It happens because of, of people's support and people's uh, fondness and, and love of the Arboretum. You think that that's our responsibility as the people who enjoy it now is to make sure that it continues to be ready for the future and for um, our kids and grandkids. Tonight, we celebrate the beauty and emotional power of the Arboretum. Imagined by the Olmsted brothers decades ago and nurtured by current stewards like Ray Larson and Peter Putnicki, the Arboretum is a 230-acre masterpiece right in the heart of our city. This natural majesty inspires art in many forms. We are so honored to have the works of Julie Spidell and John Grady represented tonight, not to mention the creative spirit of our youngest artists in the Fiddlehead Forest Preschool. As you just heard from Jane and from Gerard Sudakawa, sometimes it takes community to make art come alive and reinforce that virtuous circle between art and nature. Community. That's something I treasure in particular in my work with the Arboretum Foundation. How our community comes together, not only for the extraordinary projects like the replacement of the beloved Sudakawa Gates, but also for the everyday stewardship of the grounds that inspire us all, for the Budo dancers and calligraphy artists in the Japanese garden, for those greenhouse volunteers who craft amazing wreaths for the holiday sale, for the field trips and summer camps that inspire young artists and adventurers. Your gift tonight makes all this and more possible. We thank you for being part of the Arboretum community and are honored to have your support. Well, thank you, Jenny and all. You know, there have been a lot of hard moments in the last couple of years and to hear about this happy ending with the gate, it is, Gates, it is really heartwarming. 
Indeed, and I'd like to thank everyone who donated to that campaign with a special note of appreciation to our lead donors, Peter and Shannon Van Offen. And speaking of donors, our audience has been busy. You have been busy. Thank you, Jeff Lehman and Katrina Russell, $5,000. Dave and Chris Town, another $5,000. Napier and Joan Affleck Smith, $5,000. This is good. Yes. Oh, la, uh, la, 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 la. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot coming in here. Uh, yes, Janice Weary, $5,000 and a leadership gift from Lynn Garvey. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, Trina Weary, uh, a number of our board members, Trina Weary, Kat Korob, uh, Beverly Song, Tyler Moriguchi. Uh, thank you so much. Um, lovely contributions from both of our co-chairs. Thank you, Bill McGee and Lee Heck, 2,500. Joanna and Krishna Tiagarajan, 2,500. And thanks to Scott and board chair Jenny Wyatt for their $4,000 contribution. Yes, every gift makes a difference, a gift of any size, as we just work to make the Arboretum welcoming and accessible for everyone in the community. $50 helps with garden gloves for the stewards. $500 supports outreach for lower income students. And I see we have a couple of other, Karen Overstreet, just in a donation, and Mark Rowley, we appreciate you. Dabney Rohrbach, Della Balick, Stephanie Otis, thank you so much. You know, this is probably a good time to talk about our $75,000 matching pool, courtesy of the Aldera Foundation and the estate of Alec Bayless, both made possible through the passion of long-term supporters and volunteers for the Arboretum. So the first $75,000 of the gifts received will be matched one to one, so your gift goes twice as far. Okay, well speaking of gifts, I think things are starting to add up. So, I don't know, I feel like I wanna do a drum roll, but Cisco, you're just gonna have to bring the action. Well, I'll tell you what, I just <laughs> looked at the thermometer. La cochina varita, it is going up like a rocket ship. We are over the $200,000 level. But there is still open space on that thermometer. We got to put the El Kabatsky on that right now. So I'm going to have some ideas for you that you might just want to bid on. So one is a wonderful dinner cruise. It's on this incredible yacht called the San Suchi. And uh, if you're really good, they might let you dive in and go for a swim. I don't know. I'm sure they'll serve Brussels sprouts on that one, too. But don't eat too many because it's hard to swim right after that. Okay. And how about the Mariner Suite for 20 people? So you're going to be able to bring all your best friends to a Mariner game and just have a blast. And I got to tell you, I've been in the Mariner Suite. I actually got to throw the first pitch <gasps> in a Mariner game. It was the most exciting thing I've ever done in my whole life. My windup was so good. Unfortunately, my pitch wasn't so good. But hey, you can't win them all, but you're gonna have a lot of fun. And you know those Mariners are getting better and better. So let's fill that thermometer up right away. I bet your pitch had style. He's like, yeah, it did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's like, think of our head style. Well, nobody could ever hit that pitch, I can tell you that much. <laughs> we got to pull up the video of that next year. <laughs> well, look, we just received, and this is something that's really exciting. We just received an anonymous gift in the amount of $10,000. So it puts us so close to our goal. So thank you, friend of the Arboretum. And also a big thank you to Missy Ward and Jay Johnston for your gift of $3,500. And I see one just came in from Marwan Kashkush. Thank you, and Scott Lindsay. Carol Ravano and Michael Cheever. Uh, a portion of the gifts received this evening will support cultural programs at the Seattle Japanese Garden. So the garden reopens for the season on March 1st. Um, and I'd like to thank our friends at Seattle Parks and Recreation who do such a magnificent job in caring for the garden and the Arboretum. Yeah, and I see there are some great private tours of the Japanese garden in the auction. Yeah, in fact, and by one of our co-chairs tonight and then a, a, another board member and another docent. So okay. lots of lots of great tours. All right, well, speaking of the auction, remember to check out all of the other amazing tours, the art, the getaways. I think Cisco has sold it pretty well. That Vashon stay sounds wonderful. I've, and you know, we talked about the Heyday Farms, which sounds fantastic. And then of course the raptor watching. Yeah, very cool. 
Okay, so it looks like right now we have a lot of bidding going on on the Skagit burning adventure. I'm waiting to hear now like if there are any bidding wars going on. It's always fun when you can, and you're doing it for a good cause, Indeed. right? Indeed. It's not completely Indeed. selfish. You know, it has been so much fun exploring the links between art and nature this evening. I love the theme. I love just being here. You know, and in some cases, it really is this, um, it's a personal connection. But what's special in this Arboretum context is the chance to build community around shared experience. So we want to hear more from the coolest historian that we know, Jennifer Ott. The Arboretum is a living work of art that inspires creativity among all kinds of artists. But can all that natural beauty, creativity, and art have an even greater purpose? It can when it brings people together. It's interesting to read uh, Frederick Law Olmsted Sr.'s writings. He didn't see green spaces as just amenities. He saw them as a really essential part of building a community, building a healthy community. He's right in that era when uh, universal suffrage is uh, making people realize that if you don't have a healthy populace, then you will not have a healthy democracy. And that's not just in their physical health, it's also in what we would call their mental health. And so you want to have places where people can come together from a wide variety of backgrounds. He waxes poetic about that when he talks about Prospect Park, of just his experience seeing people from all different income levels, all different religious backgrounds, all different um, ethnicities coming together. And um, not to sugarcoat it, there were certainly issues with um, disparities in his time as there are in ours. But he was really focused on how you could have these community spaces in the city within reach. And that could be somewhere that people could come together and meet. When we take in the finely crafted view of Azalea Way from the gazebo, or enjoy a performance in the Japanese garden, the designer or artist is giving us a shared lens by which to think about and understand the world. But sometimes it works in reverse, where it's community that provides the artist with the creative spark. Middle Fork is a, a very large project that um, my team and I and many, many other volunteers created um, a few years ago. And many people participated in it. It was, it was a project that was designed to have people just come off the street and help us work with um, building the sculpture. And it was based on making a plaster cast of a living Doug fir that was 130 feet tall, so very impractical choice. Um, but what I was interested in was bringing these casts into an environment where I could have people come in off the street and respond to those casts and help us build just a very small part of that sculpture. And I think by the time we finished finished making the sculpture, uh, we had an, almost 4,000 people helped work on that. One of my, my favorite stories is of a, a young woman who was very engaged with the project, and she was one of the people that over a year-long period would come every week, sometimes a couple of times a week. And um, there was this great progression where um, maybe the fifth or sixth time she came in, she came in with this guy, and they were kind of working together, and we didn't see him again. But then another guy came in a week later. So she was clearly vetting dates, one stuck. Um, and what I love is that they're married now. So thinking about this context of, of bringing people in and, and how you can um, you know, permeate into their lives is really beautiful. The challenges of the pandemic have underscored how we as humans crave coming together for shared experiences. So it was especially poignant to assemble for the garden party last August on a magnificent summer evening to hear the world premiere of Paul Chahara's The Garden of Enchantment, commissioned by the Arboretum Foundation for Seattle Japanese Garden's 60th anniversary. Mr. Chihara wrote this piece as a love letter to his parents, tracing his childhood, the hardships of internment, and later a career full of Hollywood film scores and world-class orchestra debuts. And he shared all of it through a beautiful piece of music played in a dreamy, magical garden. I'm very honored and very happy to be here. What's next as we explore the art of nature in the Arboretum? I think the idea of bringing people together and creating um, a, an interesting or dynamic social uh, space is, is something that we could explore with what, what we're talking about doing for the Arboretum. 
I think that it will begin from the very beginning as a social event in terms of thinking about the why of the piece. And it may be that we're trying to draw people into parts of the Arboretum that they don't typically go to, so that it's a kind of a destination event. Or maybe we go in another direction where it's a very celebrated area that we can reframe um, for a, a, a shorter period of time, um, relatively speaking, to these trees growing and think about it differently. But however that goes, I'm just really excited about the idea um, that we do get to engage this community and that we, we try to grow the community in an interesting way. The Seattle Japanese Garden is our own community's treasured work of art. Our garden is immortalized in photographs, sculpture, watercolor paints, and all matter of modern media. Other artists inspired by the garden include Art Wolf, Molly Hashimoto, Michelle Kamata, and many more. For generations, artists have been inspired by the garden. Tonight, you've heard from Gerard Sitakawa, whose father created the memorial gates in the Arboretum, and who himself created a stunning entry gate to the garden in 2009. The Arboretum Foundation is the support organization for the Seattle Japanese Garden. Your support makes it possible for the care and maintenance of the garden. Please click on the donate button on your devices now and thank you for your support. Beautiful, and um, the art of nature, I love that. And we are just so overwhelmed by your generosity tonight. We have some um, new donors to thank, Dan Hinckley, Steve Garber, uh, Eliza Davidson, to name a few. Karen Whitney, Kyoko Matsuda, uh, Anthony Allison, and Bill Lindberry. Um, and everyone who's donated tonight, and sorry if we, we didn't mention you by name, it's moving awfully fast on our, on our ticker. Look, we are getting really close to our goal, but how close? Let's go to Cisco. All right. Oh, la, 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 la. We, have, we are almost to the top. I am so excited. I'm excited beyond Tweedle. But there's eight minutes left, so keep bidding. We got to fill that thermometer up right away. All right, our goal, $250,000 tonight. And just, oh my gosh, see, it's going up. So Cisco, maybe we just stay on you and have you just do this. This one, <laughs> Cisco is so ready for it. So uh, we will keep the donation link open through Friday morning. So if you didn't give, you wanna give again, or you have a friend who wants to get in the action, there's still an opportunity. But I will say that the auction is going to close promptly at seven o'clock. So if there's items that you're watching, um, now is probably a good time to be thinking about your final strategy. Yes, you got about eight minutes left, and then we're just about seven thousand or so dollars away from our goal. So jump in, be the hero tonight. It really is a community effort when it comes to supporting the arboretum. Thanks again to this evening's sponsors. And kudos to Bill and Joanna, our magnificent co-chairs for tonight's event the Arboretum Foundation board and staff who brought all of this together, everyone who donated to the auction, our video guest stars, and especially to you, the supporters that make this work possible. All right, it looks like it's time, as you mentioned, the final countdown for the auction. Don't miss out on your favorite item. So many of them are just one of a kind items, pieces of art, um, works of art, I should say, and just experiences you can't replicate. So it has been tremendous being with you. I hope to see you at the dedication of the new gates. Absolutely. Looking forward to that. I've definitely have renewed my super fan status and I'm gonna pitch to my evening cohorts, Jim, Kim, and Saint that we come on down and, but you gotta find us something that we won't ruin or mess up. Like, is there a group project that we can just- We'll, we'll, we'll get you the beginner group project. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I think that- uh, I think as Cisco we, wants to go maybe. <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I think Cisco should deliver this news. <laughs> well, hey, this has been the most tremendous time I've ever had in my life. And I want to thank all you gardening cats and gators for making our arboretum the best one in the world. Oh la la. Yeah, we, we met our goal. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> uh oh, there are lights. Okay. Cisco might start thanks. dancing. We better go. <laughs> uh, thanks, Angela. It's been great to have you with us. And of course, thanks to Cisco Morris, who does so much for the Arboretum and for the whole community. 
Uh, and good night and thanks for joining us and spending your Thursday with us. We did it. We okay, did it. Good Have night. a great night. Good night. Tremendous. 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 Wow, that was fun. Wow, that was fun. And inspiring. Thank you for being a part of the art of nature. And for supporting the Washington Park Arboretum. Have a great 2022. And we will see you all in the arm. <laughs>